What we're going to talk about today is doing an insurance needs analysis for clients and doing that in the area of life insurance. So we're just going to cover a few simple ways to figure out the insurance need for a client. And I feel this is very important because you know, over the years, I'm actually really surprised at how many people I've sat down with that have zero life insurance. You know, even if they have a lot of debt, maybe they have young kids at home and they have an income coming and they're not protected. So if they have no insurance at all, they really need to get that in place. And a lot of people will say they just haven't got around to it. Well, if something happens, that's just not going to matter. It's not going to be a valid excuse. The other thing I hear is people say, well, I'm young. I'm not going to die anytime soon. But the problem is we see people dying at a young age, getting critical illnesses, these sorts of things. So we just never know when our time is up. So we need to make sure we have that in place. Another thing that I see is people are often they're underinsured. It's, it's actually very common. And sometimes people tell me, well, I already have coverage through work. But usually there, what we see is, you know, one to two and a half times annual income. And as we go through this, you're going to see why that just is not enough at all. And the other thing is, is if people have just coverage through work, if they were to get laid off, they no longer have that coverage. And they might have, in the interim, they might have gotten to a point where maybe they're no longer insurable for whatever reason. So they need to make sure they have their own coverage in place. The other thing is, is if people don't have enough coverage, um, sometimes they do have something, but they're paying way too much for what they do have. And what they don't understand is not all insurances are created equal. So they probably have the wrong kind of coverage, but they could have the right amount if they get the right kind and have it at a much more affordable cost. So we help people figure out all those items so that they can do this the most efficient way possible. Here are the four quick methods that we want to cover today. Number one is the dime method. So I'll go through and explain what those four letters represent and how we calculate that. The second one is the four zero method. It's actually very accurate and very easy and is actually my favorite method when I'm sitting down with clients. Next is the 10 times method, which is the easiest and fastest and gives us a pretty accurate number. And lastly is the software method which is most accurate. And there's a lot of tools online for coming up with this number, but we actually have a custom spreadsheet that we use where we just plug in numbers that we gather and it comes down with an exact number that they need as far as coverage goes. So now let's go through each in a little bit more detail so you can understand how they work. So we'll start with the dime method. As an example, if we have a couple, we'll have two clients to calculate for. And the number can differ a lot based on income, but just in the interest of time, we'll just look at the one side here. So D stands for debt. That includes credit cards, personal loans, lines of credit, student loans, that sort of thing. And then it's easiest to have a total debt for both people included on both sides, just so should anything happen, all of those can just be paid out and, and be done with. The I stands for income. And generally what this will represent is replacement income for 10 years. And that could fluctuate a little bit, uh, kind of based on the age of dependents and children, that sort of thing. And so in this scenario, what we're looking at is replacing an income of $60,000 for 10 years, which is a total of 600,000. M is the next item, which stands for mortgage. And so really that's just the remaining balance on the mortgage. So that that'll just be taken care of and, and we'll get rid of that mortgage debt should either person pass away. And lastly, E stands for post-secondary education. So those are the costs for, for kids to go away to school. And in this scenario, what we're looking at is $120,000, which represents $15,000 per year for two kids for four years each of post-secondary education. So that's actually pretty conservative, that number. So that brings the total coverage amount to $1,070,000. Now it's not necessarily 100% precise, but it's very close. And so it doesn't calculate for things like inflation really, but by having this amount, a person's not gonna be drastically underinsured. Uh, for the most part, the family's gonna be okay. And so really, as you can see, based on what's getting paid off and what it provides for, no one is really getting rich in this scenario. And really all we're doing is just removing a bunch of stress if the worst case happens and that person that is left behind can just focus on the grieving process. 
So the next one we're going to look at is the 4-0 method. And this one here is based on the premise of investing the lump sum that comes from a death benefit on behalf of that family and being able to generate a 7.2% rate of return on that investment and then basically pulling off the growth every year to replace the income that's gone. It's pretty cool how it works actually. And really what it is, it's just a quick calculation to get a sense of whether that family will have enough cash flow coming in to satisfy their expenses every month. So if we just take an example and let's say we had a million dollars coming in, in as a death benefit. What we do is we drop the last four zeros on that number and what we're left is $100. We take that number times two to get $200. And what that $200 represents is how much money the family would have per day to live on. Then we take that number and times it by an average of 30 days per month. So in this example, what, we, what we'd be left with is $6,000 per month for that family to live on. And then from there, the simple question is, would $6,000 per month be enough for them, for them to get by on considering mortgage payment and obviously all the regular expenses and debt payments and those sorts of things that the family has to think about. So again, as you can see here, no one's really getting rich. We're just looking to find the amount which will ensure that all the bills will be paid going forward on a monthly basis and essentially remove any financial stress that that family would have if they had no extra money coming in to take care of their standard of living. Another thing you may want to look at when considering the 4-0 method, and for a lot of people, is they just don't like having debt, especially big debts like a mortgage. So they may say, I just want to pay that out and be done with it. So what we could look at doing is taking $300,000 out of that lump sum death benefit, paying off the mortgage, who would still be left with $700,000 that we could invest on their behalf. So same idea applies if that money is invested and can get a 7.2% rate of return. Now what we do is we drop the last four zeros, but now we're only left with $70. You take that times the two, and we get $140 per day that would be available for that family to spend. Again, look at the 30-day average per month times 30. That family would now have $4,200 per month that they would need to have uh, or that they could use to supply the income they need to pay all their other expenses that are left over. But the nice thing is now we can consider that their biggest monthly payment, which is usually the mortgage, is now out of the picture, gives them more peace of mind, less money, sure, but now their expenses aren't as much and it's still going to take away that financial stress and it gives them a better picture of you know what's going to be available now that that mortgage is gone still make sure there's enough to cover all the other bills maybe look at their budget and make sure that's enough the next one i want to talk about is the 10 times method and this is probably the most simple one it really just says that if you're going to replace income for 10 years or you want to replace it for that long, you just take the annual income times 10 years. So in this example, you take that $60,000 income times 10, that's $600,000 is what the death benefit should be. If you're wanting to replace income for longer, for 15 years, for example, you just take that annual times 15 to get the 900000 So this one is really simple. It doesn't really take into account things like inflation, not even really a rate of return. I know some people will say, well, if you were to take that money and invest it and get a 10% rate of return, you could literally just pull the growth off every year to replace income and not really drain that principal. But the reality is, if you're investing in death benefit, you wanna be really conservative. So you're probably only going to plan for five to 7% rate of return. So even going back to the four zero method, even with that one, you may wanna look at and, and see what if it's only getting a 5% rate of return instead of 7%, is it still gonna be enough to replace that family's income? Okay, so this one you might wanna go a little bit further, but this gives you kind of a ballpark idea. The other thing I wanted to touch on very quickly as well for people to keep in mind is that, you know, this is based on someone's income, but let's say you have a stay-at-home spouse who's taking care of kids, is cleaning the home, getting groceries, doing all that work on the home front. Lots of times that's a lot tougher job. And so they bring a financial implication to that household and so they need to be covered as well and so when you're looking at that it's sometimes it's hard to pinpoint but it probably should be at least enough uh, to replace similar income to their spouse and also take into consideration if something were to happen to them 
what are their costs going to be as far as child care, uh, cleaning the house, whatever needs to be done around the house that they would normally do. We need to factor that in as well. It's very important. The last one I'm going to touch on here is the software method, which is usually the best one to utilize if you can. Uh, it's just going to be a lot more accurate when you're using something like a spreadsheet or a, or a software program that you find online. And some of the great things about it is that it can factor in things like the rate of return that you might get when you invest proceeds from the death benefit of an insurance policy. The other thing it does is it factors in inflation over a period of time, which is really important because over the course of 15, 20 years, things just end up costing a lot more. So it's important so that person doesn't run out of money. Another great thing is you can easily add requirements for additional debts and other items like childcare and final expenses, which a lot of the time get left out. And these are things that can still cost a lot. So it's important to have that in there as well. You're also able to play around with replacing certain percentages of each person's income. So if something happens to that breadwinner, how much of that do you want to replace? And that's something to consider too, right? Because if you have a family of four, uh, two parents, two kids, if one of the parents goes away, unfortunately, uh, their monthly expenses are going to go down because there's just not as many people eating in that household and those sorts of things. So you can probably bring that down a little bit and you can play around with that. So one of the greatest things about the software method is that you can look at various scenarios very quickly because you're just punching numbers in and it's giving you an answer right away instead of having to do some calculations manually. So as a result, it's, it's providing a much more accurate analysis of the need for the consumer because you really are just plugging in some key numbers that you got from the client and it's spitting out the answer. So you're not having to waste a lot of time. And again, like I say, you can be sometimes doing this right in front of the client, playing with different scenarios and also helping them find what they're going to be comfortable with going for. So you've probably noticed that we've spent quite a bit of time talking about this. And as a result, you might be asking yourself, why is this process so important? And really what it comes down to is the need. The most important thing is for a family to get the right amount of coverage. Now, keep in mind, we don't necessarily want someone to be overinsured, but the reality is most of the situations I've seen people are drastically underinsured. And what I can tell you from experience is that can absolutely devastate a family if they don't have enough. So certainly we don't want them to be overinsured, but I'll tell you this, it's way better to be overinsured than to be underinsured. But once we have that need figured out, the next thing that we need to look at is in order to satisfy the amount that they need, we have to look at their budget. The first one to look at is if somebody has a tight budget. Because I know a lot of times people think that insurance has to be expensive, but it really doesn't have to. So somebody could look at getting a term policy, which can be very affordable. And some of the main ones are 10 year term, 20 year term, 30 year term. So with this, basically what you're paying for is pure insurance. There's no savings component to, to it whatsoever. To give you an idea, a 40-year-old male could get a $500,000 coverage policy on a 20-year term policy for about $50 a month. And they could make that even cheaper if they went to a 10-year term. So it really make, makes it so that people, no matter what their budget is, they should be able to afford to pay for that because a $500,000 coverage, that could cover a mortgage, for example, and we all know that people are spending $50 a month on other things that they really don't need that much. As well, these policies are RNC, which stands for Renewable and Convertible. So it'll automatically renew at the end of the term, regardless of what their health status is. And it's also convertible to a permanent policy if they want to make that permanent somewhere down the road and they have more of a budget to work with. The second one here is for people that have what I would call a medium budget, which is really probably going to fluctuate between $100 to $500 per month. Uh, keep in mind that that's going to change a lot depending on age as well, because obviously the older you get, the more expensive it is. But somebody in this bracket, really what we're probably going to do is combine uh, a little bit of permanent coverage and add a term rider to make up the difference of how much they need. So you could get a base policy of permanent coverage, which could be $25,000, probably up to $250,000 worth of coverage, and then add the rest as a term rider to help 
meet the budget requirements. So they might be adding as much as $750,000, let's call it, as a 20 year term to meet other requirements. So this one, what it is, is there's some overfunding that takes place. And that overfunding is used to fund an investment that can get a rate of return. Uh, sometimes with a whole life policy, it's gonna be more of a guaranteed type of investment. But the idea here is you have two components now. You have life insurance and you have a savings component. Now, the savings component that might be used later on for retirement. Uh, so if a person saves a substantial amount in there, it can, can add a lot to the retirement. And there are ways if it's done properly to access those dollars tax-free later. The other thing with the coverage um, on the term side is that you can layer that coverage if you wanted to. So you might have a debt requirement that's for the next 10 years. You would have a certain amount as a 10-year term that covers just that, and then after that it falls off. Then you might have a 20-year term rider that covers the remainder of your mortgage, which might fall off after 20 years because you don't need that anymore. So you can really custom fit this to suit the person's need, whatever that may be. And lastly, what I really like about the savings component is, is as you're building up a cash value, you know, somebody wakes up down the road five years into this program, maybe they have five, ten thousand dollars saved up the investment component. But let's say they fall on hard times, maybe they get laid off, and they can't afford that premium payment anymore. But with a term policy, they might not be able to pay that anymore, and they're going to lose that coverage if they're not paying that premium. Whereas when there's a permanent component and there's a savings component, if they absolutely needed to, in a lot of cases, what they're able to do is access the cash value to pay the premiums on the insurance portion of the policy for them. So they might be able to do that for the next year or two if they're out of work. And then as soon as they're back to work, start paying in the premium again. And the most important part, the most important part here is that they were able to keep that coverage. So if anything bad were to happen, their family's still going to be provided for. And the last one here is for people that have a very large budget or no budget restrictions whatsoever, and they would look at getting basically all permanent coverage. And so the range here is, I mean, it could be a wide range, it could be anything. It could be somebody putting away $500 a month. And I've seen policies as big as where people are contributing $100,000 per year or even more to that. And obviously the more they're contributing, usually the bigger the, the death benefit coverage that is available there. So you might ask, well, why would somebody want that? A lot of people say, well, at some point in your life, you don't really need insurance coverage anymore. Well, and I would argue against that because we all have things like final expenses, but there can also be a lot bigger expenses. But one of the things that we look at too is people using these policies for retirement. So they may not want to have everything in a, in a registered environment and a pension environment, and they can be investing in these policies, getting a good rate of return, where you can build a lot of wealth here. And if done properly, there's ways for them to access that in retirement and access those dollars for retirement tax-free. The other big one is for people that know they're never going to spend all their wealth, but they want to pass it on to the next generation. When it's tied to an insurance policy like this, it can be passed to the next generation completely 100% tax-free. A lot of people don't know that that's how insurance works. So that's a way to buy bypass probate and all those sorts of things. So things aren't tied up in an estate for a year or two. The other thing is looking at paying final taxes. When, when people look at such things as succession plans for businesses where uh, when the owner passes away, they're passing it down to kids or whatever, maybe there's a taxable event there. They want to have funds available to pay those taxes so the next generation can take over the business and, and not have to worry about coming up with money for the tax bill. We also see it a lot for vacation properties and rental properties where, you know, the person wants those properties to stay in the family. But what they need to understand is because of capital gains tax, sometimes there's a huge tax liability when they pass away. And for the next generation, if they don't have those funds available and they can't borrow those funds, they can't keep that property in the family. So they end up having, having to liquidate it anyways. But if there's insurance proceeds coming in that will pay that tax liability, they can keep that property in the in the family for generations to come. And we also see that a lot with farming operations where you know, they want the next generation to take over, but there's just no way for them to pay the tax bill or, or pay off a lot of the debts that accrue that can be quite large. So that's another way to ensure the next generation can take it over. And again, the other idea is that again, you know, anything that is not 
needed for paying taxes and that sort of thing, they again can leave to their family completely tax free. And it's way for that next generation, not starting from zero. Nowadays, it's tough to become a homeowner. It's tough to save enough money for retirement. And this is just a way that if, if they're not using all those dollars in their retirement, they can give the next generation a great start to be on the track to, again, having a good retirement or enjoying these properties that they've built up over time. Now, another thing that you're going to want to watch for is that there are some people out there that they want to pay the cheapest amount for anything that they get. So when it comes to insurance, they want to pay the least amount no matter what. Uh, they don't want to be put in a position where they feel like they're paying for really expensive life insurance. So an important thing to keep in mind for those who do have enough dollars in their budget but don't want to take advantage of some of these programs is that price is only an issue in the absence of value. So that really brings us to the last concept I want to talk about, which is something called rent versus own. So let's look at a comparison here. Let's say somebody had an insurance need of $500,000, and that could be to cover debt, that could be income protection purposes, what have you. And they say they need that to cover at least 20 years. Another thing we add all the time is critical illness coverage. Um, we're not going to dive into the need for that today. But basically what you're looking at here is just over $50 for the 20 year term life coverage and just over $60 for the critical illness. So that comes to a total of $115 per month. Another way that we could do that coverage is on the own side. So here what we could have is a $50,000 permanent life coverage and layer in a $450,000 20-year term rider as life coverage. So bring them up to that total of $500,000 that they need. Add the exact same critical illness rider, level to age 75. Now, how we, how we would set that up would be about $250 per month to make sure there's a little bit of overfunding in order to build up an investment value inside that policy. To make my point, I want you to consider another scenario of rent versus ownership. So if we think about living in a home and having home ownership, so you have to have somewhere to live. So let's say you're renting a house and you were paying $1,500 a month to rent that home. Now, at the end of the day, how much equity are you building? You could live in that property for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. At the end of the day, all that money has gone. You get nothing back. Or... You could go get a mortgage and maybe buy that exact same house. And let's say you can get your mortgage payment to come in at $1,500 a month. Let's say it's the exact same monthly payment. But now what are you doing? Every month that you pay down that mortgage, you're building up equity in that property. Now, on the ownership side of a home, you have to pay property tax on top of that. You're going to have to pay for some upkeep. So maybe you're paying another three to $500 per month. So you're actually, in the end, you're going to pay more to own that home. But would you still do it? Of course you would. That's what most people want to do, is they would rather own a home because they're building equity. So that's the same thing that we're going to talk about here. That $250 per month is more than the $115 per month. But let's, let's look at this over time and see the equity that you can build. So again, what we're going to look at here is what happens over time. So we started out, this was a 40-year-old male. We're going to look at where we're at at age 60. So starting on the rent side, or what's known as the cheap side, what happens is after 20 years, that 20-year term, there's two choices. Either the life coverage ends, or it, they can automatically renew. But how term insurance works is the prices jump really fast. And a lot of times it's not affordable. So what happens is that premium now goes to $943 per month. A little stat out there is roughly only 3% of term policies ever pay out because when they renew, they get too expensive. People can't keep them. So that is an option, but most likely that coverage is going to end. The critical illness coverage of $50,000 is still in place. We're running that out to age 75. That's still $62 per month. So where we're at 20 years down the road is this person has invested $27,511 and no matter what they do at this point, they can't get any money back, nothing at all. So let's compare it to our own side. 
So on the ownership side at age 60, what happens now is there's still going to be $69,000 worth of permanent life coverage. So the $450,000 20-year rider, we're just going to let that fall off. And that other $50,000, it actually grows and it automatically grows because it has to automatically add coverage, which you don't have to apply for, but it automatically has to add a little bit more coverage to keep the investment under the tax rules. So that's a little bit of a complicated uh, explanation, but just know that you still have some coverage. The critical illness rider is still in place. And at this point, we're still paying $250 per month. At this point, the person has invested a total of $60,000. If they decided today to cancel this program, they would get $64,346 back. So it's kind of a worst case scenario. It's a money back guarantee in a way. So let's play this out for 15 more years just to see where it ends up at age 75. So. On the rent side with the term program, at age 75, the critical illness coverage just ends. That's when that policy is set to run till. So now there's no coverage in place. No life, no critical illness. The total investment has been $38,779 and that money's gone. It's rented. It's just like car insurance where if you never ever make a claim, you never get any money back. So again, there's no way to get any money back here whatsoever. On the ownership side, what does it look like at age 75? Well, we're no longer putting any premium payments into it, but at age 75, because they've had to automatically grow that death benefit to keep it within the tax laws so that we don't have a taxable event, there's now about $250,000 worth of permanent life coverage. The critical illness coverage does end, so that is no longer available to us, uh, but we have built up a significant amount of cash value. So we no longer have to pay that $250 per month going forward. Any cost of insurance is going to be paid out of the cash value. So as you can see here, going forward, the total dollars invested, no more is going to be invested. $75,000 has been invested. The cash value or investment value is now $182,000. So when we look at the overall package here, we have built some equity. We have ownership now. You have some permanent coverage left over to pay for final expenses, maybe some final taxes, whatever the case may be, leave a bit of a legacy for your family, but you also have built up $182,000 that you could be using potentially for some retirement funds as well. And that's really what the wealthy do in a lot of cases is they're always looking for ways to build wealth, uh, build equity, build net worth. And that's what we've done in the second scenario here with the permanent coverage. So as we wrap up here, just a quick reminder, hopefully we've given you some tools to help you figure out the insurance need for people that you're sitting down with in a quick and easy fashion. The most important thing to remember is to get them the right amount. So we just went through an example of building up equity, building up cash value, but the reality is if that doesn't fit into their budget, the most important thing is to get them term coverage, to get them the proper coverage so that if the worst case scenario ever happens, their family is going to be taken care of. Now, if they have more of a budget, you can show them these other examples where they can build equity. And what happens there then is for that person who's maybe on the fence and wants to, wants to make it really cheap, they realize that if they go with the equity side and what we call the ownership side of permanent coverage, it's a way to invest and eventually get money back and or build money for the future for retirement. So always put the client first, always give them the right coverage and then look at their budget and make sure that it fits properly so they don't get into trouble down the road and you will have done the right thing and you'll get a ton of referrals going forward and hopefully this process is going to make it easy, easier for you to do that and get results in a quick and efficient manner.